Let me show you how to be a good be- Structural Equation Modeling, or SEM, is a key framework in causal inference. As I'm diving deeper and deeper into these topics to teach them and, well, finally understand them, I was delighted to host Ed Merkel on the show. A professor of psychological sciences at the University of Missouri, Ed discusses his work on Bayesian applications to psychometric models and model estimation, particularly in the context of Bayesian SEM. He explains the importance of Bayesian SEM in psychometrics and the challenges encountered in its estimation. Ed also introduces his Blavin package in R, which enhances researchers' capabilities in Bayesian SEM and has been instrumental in the dissemination of these methods. Additionally, he explores the role of Bayesian methods in forecasting and crowdsourcing wisdom. And when he's not thinking about stats and psychology, Ed can be found running, playing the piano, or playing 8-bit video games. This is Learning Bayesian Statistics, episode 102, recorded February 14, 2024. Let me show you how to be a good busy and change your predictions after taking information in. And if you're thinking I'll be less than amazing, let's adjust those expectations. What's a Bayesian? It's someone who cares about evidence and doesn't... Welcome to Learning Bayesian Statistics, a podcast about Bayesian inference, the methods, the projects, and the people who make it possible. I'm your host, Alex Andorra. You can follow me on Twitter at Alex underscore Andorra, like the country. For any info about the show, learnbaitstats.com is la place to be. Show notes, becoming a corporate sponsor, unlocking Bayesian merch, supporting the show on Patreon, everything is in there. That's learnbaitstats.com. If you're interested in one-on-one mentorship, online courses, or statistical consulting, feel free to reach out and book a call at topmate.io slash Alex underscore Andorra. See you around, folks, and best Bayesian wishes to you all. Ed Merkel, welcome to Learning Bayesian Statistics. Uh, Thank you for having me. Yeah, you bet. Thanks a lot for taking the time. I am really happy to have you on, and I have a lot of questions. So that is perfect. Uh, Before that, as usual... Um, how do you define the work you're doing nowadays and how did you end up working on this? Well, um, a lot of my work right now is um, with Bayesian applications to psychometric models and uh, model estimation. Uh, Over time, I've gotten more and more into the model estimation and computation uh, as opposed to applications. And it was a slow process to get here. I I started doing some Bayesian modeling when I was working on my PhD. I finished that in 2005, and Mm -hmm. I felt a bit restricted by what I could do with the tools I had at that time. But things have improved a a lot since then, and also I've learned a lot since then. So um, I have over time left some things and come back to them. And uh, when I come back to them, I find there's uh, more progress like that can be made. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And, uh, and that's always super interesting and inspiring to, to see the, uh, uh, such diverse backgrounds on, on the show. I'm, I'm always happy to, to see that. Um, and by the way, thanks a lot to, uh, Jorge Sinval to, um, do the introduction. Uh, today is February 14th, and he was our matchmaker. So yes, thanks uh, a lot, uh, Jorge. <laughs> and uh, yeah, like uh, uh, this promises to be a, a great episode. So thanks a lot for the, the suggestion. Um, yes. And Ed, actually, could you tell us the topics that you are particularly focusing on? Um, yeah, recently, so in psychology, psychometrics, education, there's this class of models, structural equation models. It's a a pretty large class of models. And I think some special cases have been really useful. Others sometimes get a bad reputation with, I think, certain groups of statistics people. But it's Mm -hmm. this big class and it, it has interested me for a long time because so much can done can be done with this class of models 
So the, the Bayesian estimation part has especially been interesting to me um, because it was relatively underexplored for a long time. And there's some unique challenges there that uh, I have found and I've tried to make some progress on. <laughs> Yeah, uh, and, and we're gonna dive into these uh, these topics for sure in the in the coming minutes. But to still talk about your your background, do you remember how you first got introduced to Bayesian inference and also why they they sticked with you? Yes, um, I think part of part of how I got interested in, in Bayesian inference starts a lot earlier to when I was um, when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. I'm about the age where my the first half of my childhood there were no computers, and the second half of growing up, um, people computers were in people's houses. The internet was coming around, and and so on. So I, I grew up with uh, you know having a, a computer in my house for the first time, and then yeah just messing around with it and learning how to do things on it. So then later, you know, a, a while later when I was working on my PhD, I grew up with the computing uh, topics and I enjoyed that. So um, I felt at the time with, with Bayesian estimation, some of the interesting computing things were coming out around the time I was working on my PhD. So for example, Windbugs was a big thing, um, say around 2000, 2001 or so. Mm -hmm. That was when I was starting to work on my PhD. And that seemed like a fun little program where you could build these models and do some Bayesian estimation. At the time, I didn't always know exactly what I was doing, but I still found it interesting and uh, perhaps a bit more intuitive than some of the other uh, methods that were out there at the time. Yeah, um, and actually, it seems like you you've been part of that of that movement uh, which introduced patient stats a lot in a in the psychological um, sciences. Um, can you elaborate on the role of the patient framework in psychology in psychological research? Always a hard word. To say yeah. uh, when you have a French accent, it's our. <laughs> I understand. Um, so yeah, when I was working on my PhD, I think there was not a lot of psychology applications necessarily, or mm -hmm. or maybe it was just in certain areas. So when I started on my PhD, I was doing like some cognitive psychology modeling where. You would bring someone into a room for an experiment and it could be about memory or something where you have them remember a list of words and then you give them a new list of words and ask them which did you see before and which are new and then you can model people's response times or accuracy um, so there were some bayesian applications definitely related to like memory modeling at that time but more generally there were less applications I did my PhD on, on some Bayesian structural equation modeling applications to missing data. At the time, I had a, a really hard time publishing that work. I think it was partly because huh. I just wasn't that great at writing papers at the time, but also there weren't as many Bayesian applications. So I think people were less interested. But over time, that, that has changed, I think, with with improved tools and, and more attention to Bayesian modeling. You see it more and more in psychology. Sometimes it's just a, a alternative to frequentists. Like if you're doing a regression or a mixed model, it's uh, Bayesian is just an alternative. Other times, like for these structural equation models, there can be some advantages to the Bayesian approach, especially related to characterizing uncertainty. Uh, and so I think there's more and more attention in psychology and psychometrics to some of those issues now. Yeah, um, and definitely interesting to see to hear that uh, the publishing has has gone has become easier, uh, at least for you. Uh, and a method you're especially uh, working on 
e and developing is um, Bayesian structural equation modeling or BSEM. So uh, we've never covered that yet on the show. So could you give our listeners a primer on BSEM and its importance in psychometrics? Yes. Um, so this this Bayesian structural equation modeling framework, or maybe I can start with just the structural equation modeling part. Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, that that um, overlaps with lots of other modeling mm -hmm. frameworks. So item response models and factor mm -hmm. analysis models. These are more on the measurement side, um, examining how, say, some tests or scales uh, help us to measure a person's aptitude. Those are, could all be viewed as special cases of structural equation models. But the, the heart of structural equation models involves um, like a series of regression models all in in one big model so if if you know uh, like the directed acyclic graphs that come from causal research uh, um, especially judea pearl mm -hmm. you can think of structural equation models as um, a way to estimate those types of models like these graphs will often have many variables and you have arrows between variables that reflect some causal relationships well now structural equation models are throwing likelihoods on top of that typically uh, normal likelihoods and that gives us a way to fit these sorts of models to data Whereas a directed acyclic graph would often you look at that and that helps you to know what is estimable and what is not estimable say that now the structural equation model is a, a way to fit that sort of thing to data but it al also overlaps with mixed models um like i said the item response models uh, yeah. there's some ideas related to principal components in there it's it overlaps with a lot of things yeah um that's that's really interesting to have that take you on structural uh structural equation modeling and and the relationship to uh to causal inference in a way um and so as you were saying it also relates to beauty uh to calculus and and things like that mm -hmm. uh so i definitely encourage a listener to uh dive deeper on these uh on this literature that's absolutely fascinating i really love that and that's also from my own um perspective learning about those things recently i found that it was way easier being already a bayesian right because the if you already yeah. do bayesian models from a generative modeling perspective then intervening on the graph and doing like in do calculus doing an intervention is basically like doing plus your predictive sampling as you were already doing on your on your okay. Bayesian model. But uh, instead of having already uh, conditioned on some data, you come up with uh, like the platonic uh, uh, idea of the data generative model that you have in mind. And then you intervene on the model by uh, setting some values on some of the nodes and then seeing what that gives you, uh, what that intervention gives you on the outcome. Uh, and I found that yeah. really, really natural to learn already from a Bayesian perspective. I don't know what yeah. your experience has been. Oh, yeah. I think the Bayesian perspective really helps you um, keep these models at like the the raw data level. So you're thinking yeah. about how do individual variables uh, cause other variables and what does that mean about data predictions? Um, if you look at often how frequentists present these models. Um, we have some in like random effects in these models. And so from a frequentist perspective, you wanna get rid of those random effects, marginalize them out of a model. And then for these models, we're left with some structured covariance matrix. And often the frequentists will start with, okay, you have an observed covariance matrix, and then our model implies a covariance matrix. Mm -hmm. But I find that so it's it's unintuitive to think about compared to raw data. You know, like I can see how the data 
from one variable can influence another variable. But now to mm -hmm. think about what does that mean about the prediction for a covariance, that yeah. is, I think makes it less intuitive. And that, that's really where some of the Bayesian models have an advantage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And that's why my learning myself on, on this front and, and also teaching about these topics has been extremely helpful for myself because, um, to teach it, you really have to understand it, uh, really well. Right. So that was or really a great said differently picture. that yeah. like, you don't understand it until you teach it. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've yeah. thought that I understood things before, but then when I teach it, I realize, well, I didn't quite understand everything. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, definitely. And, uh, like what advice would you give to someone who is already a Bayesian and want to learn about this structural equation modeling and to someone who is already doing psychometrics and would like to now learn about these structural equation modeling, what advice would you give to, to help them start on this path? Yeah, I think for people who already know Bayesian models, um, I think I would explain structural equation models as like um, a combination of, say, principal components or factor analysis and then regression. And I think you can, there's these expressions for the structural equation modeling framework where you have these big matrices and depending on what goes in the matrices, you get uh, certain models. I would almost advise against starting there because you can have this giant framework that's expressing matrices, but it gets very like confusing about what goes in what matrix or what does this mean from a general perspective? I would almost advise starting smaller, say with some factor analysis models, or you can have these models where there's one unobserved variable regressed on another unobserved variable. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would say like starting with some of those models and then working your way up. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if someone already knows the psychometric models and is moving to Bayesian modeling, I think the challenge is to think of the, these models again as models of data, not as models of a covariance matrix. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess that's related to what we talked about earlier, but if you know the frequentist models, typically the, just how they talk about these models involves just a covariance matrix or tricks for marginalizing over uh, the the random effects or the random parameters in the model. And I think taking a step back and looking at what does the model say about the data before we try to get rid of these random parameters, I mm -hmm. think that is, is helpful for thinking uh, through the Bayesian approach. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Super interesting. In the then. I, w I would also want to ask you once you once you've done that. So once you're into uh, BSEM, um, why is that useful, and what is its importance in your field of psychometrics these days? Yeah. So the Bayesian part, I would say, one use is. I think it slows you down a bit. There are certain, say, specifying prior distributions and really thinking through the prior distributions. This is something you don't encounter if on the frequentist side. It's going to slow you down. But I think for these models, that ends up being useful because, um, you know, if you simulate data from priors and, and really look at what are these priors saying about the sort of data I can expect, I find that helps you understand these models in a way that you don't often get from the frequentist uh, side. Uh, uh, you know, and then I guess said differently, I think over say the past 30, 40 years with these structural equation models, I think often in the field, we've come to expect that I can specify this giant model and 
and hit a button and run it. And then I get some results and report just a, a few results from this big model. I think we've, we've lost something with, with understanding what exactly is this model saying about the data. And that's a place where the Bayesian uh, versions of these models can be really helpful. Um, okay, I think yeah. there was a second part to your question, but I forgot the second yeah, part. Yeah, what, what is the what is the importance of uh, BSCM these days in psychometrics? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think there's a couple, I think, key advantages. One, again, we have random parameters that are sort of like random effects if you know mixed models. And um, with MCMC, we can sample these parameters and characterize their uncertainty or uh, allow the uncertainty in these random parameters to filter through to other model predictions. That's something that's very natural to do from a Bayesian perspective uh, and potentially not from other perspectives. Uh, uh, so the, there's a random parameter piece. Another thing that people talk about a lot is fitting these models to smaller sample sizes. So for some of these structural equation models, there's a lot happening and you can get these failures to converge for, if you're estimating frequentist versions of the model. The Bayesian models can still work there. I, I think you still have to be careful because of course, if you don't have much data, the priors are going to be more influential and, you know, sensitivity analyses and things become very important. So I, I think it's not just a, a full solution to if you don't have much data, but I think you can make some progress there with Bayesian models that are maybe more difficult with frequentist models. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, I see. Yeah. And on the other end, what are some of the biggest challenges you've encountered in BSEM estimation and how does your work address them? I've, I've found, um, I encounter problems as, as I'm working on my R package or just uh, on estimating the models. There's a number of problems that aren't completely evident when you start and one I've worked on recently and I continue to work on is specifying prior distributions for these models in a way that you know exactly what the prior distributions are in a non-software or a non-software dependent way. So in some of these models, there's um, say there's a, a covariance matrix a free parameter. So you're estimating a full covariance matrix. Yeah. Now, in certain cases of, of these models, I'm going to fix some off diagonal elements of this covariance matrix to zero, but then I want to freely estimate the rest of this covariance matrix. That becomes very difficult when you're specifying prior distributions now, because we have to keep this full covariance matrix positive definite. And I have prior distributions for like an unrestricted covariance matrix. You could do a Wishard or a LKJ say, but to have this covariance matrix where some of the entries are say fixed to zero, but I still have to keep this full covariance matrix positive definite. The, the prior distributions become very challenging there. And there's some workarounds that are, I, I would say, allow you to estimate the model, but make it difficult to describe exactly what prior distribution did you use here. I, I, that's a piece that is, continues to, to challenge me. Hmm. Yeah. And then, so what are you, uh, what are you working on these days to, to try and, and address that? Um, I, I've been, I've looked at, at some ways to decompose a covariance matrix. So mm -hmm. let's say the Koleski factors or things, mm -hmm. and we have put prior distributions on some decomposition of this covariance matrix so that yeah. it's easy to um, put, say, s some normal priors on the elements of the decomposition while maintaining this positive definite full covariance matrix. Mm -hmm. And I think I made some progress there but then you get into this situation where 
I want to put my prior distributions on intuitive things. You know, if I get to like some Kolesky factor that might have some intuitive interpret interpretation, but sometimes maybe not. And, and you run into this problem then of, okay, if I want to put a prior distribution on this, could I meaningfully do that? Or could a user meaningfully do that versus they would just use some default because they don't know what else they would put on, on that. Now that becomes a bit of a problem too. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's definitely also something I have to, to handle when I am teaching these kind of decompositions. Um, like usually the way I, teach that is when you do that on a linear regression, for instance, and you would try and infer not only the intercept and the slope, uh, but the correlation of intercept and slope. Uh, and so that way, if the intercept, like if you have a negative um, covariance matrix, for instance, that's inferred between mm -hmm. the intercept and the slope, that means, well, if you observe a group, and if you do that in a hierarchical model, particularly, that's very, that's very useful. Uh, because that means, yes. well, if I'm in a group of the hierarchical model where the intercepts are high, that probably means, means that the slopes are low. Um, um, so, yeah. because we have that negative uh, covariation. Um, and and that's interesting because that allows the model to squeeze even more information from the data and so make even more informed and accurate predictions. But of course, to do that, the challenge is that you have to infer a covariance matrix between yeah. the intercept and the slope. How do you infer that covariance matrix that usually tends to be hard and computationally intensive? And so that's where the decomposition of the covariance matrix enters the realm. So especially the yeah. Kolesky decomposition of the covariance matrix, that's what we usually recommend doing in PIMC. Uh, and we have mm -hmm. that PM.LKJ Kolesky cough distribution. And to parameterize that, you have to give a prior on the correlation matrix, which is a bit weird, mm -hmm. right? When you think about yeah. it, when people think about it, it's like, wait, uh, prior as a distribution, I understand. A prior as a distribution on a correlation matrix is hard to understand. But yeah. actually, when you decompose, it's not that hard because it's mainly, well, what's the parameter that's inside a correlation matrix? That's a parameter that says there is a correlation between A and B. Uh, and so what is mm -hmm. your a priori belief of that correlation between the intercept and the slope? Um, and so usually you don't want a completely flat prior, which says any yeah. correlation is possible with the same degree of belief. So that means, are you really saying that there is as much possibility of that of slopes and intercept to be completely positively correlated as yeah. they have a possibility to be not at all correlated. I'm not sure, right? So if you think that, yeah. then you need to use a weekly regularizing weekly informative priors as you do for any other parameters, right? So you could think of coming yeah. up with a prior that's a bit more um, a bell shape prior in a way that gives more mass to the to the um, to the low um, yeah to to smaller correlations. And then that's how, yeah. um, that's how usually you would do that in PMC. And that's what you're basically talking about. Um, that's of course, that's more complicated and it makes your model more complex. But once you have ran that model and had that inference, that can, that can be extremely useful and yeah. powerful for posterior analysis. So it's trade off. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, but that reminds me of, um, uh, I, I would say like in, in psychology um, and psychometrics, there's still a lot of hesitance to use informative priors. You know, there's still the idea of um, I'm doing, I want to do something objective. And so mm -hmm. I want my priors to be all flat, mm -hmm. um, which especially like you say, for a correlation or, or even for other parameters, I'm, I'm against, uh, you know, I, now I, w I would like to put some information in my priors always but that is always a challenge um, because like for the models i work with uh, users are accustomed like i said to specifying this big model and pressing a button and it runs and it estimates 
Uh, but now you do that in a Bayesian context with these uninformative priors. Um, sometimes you just run into problems and you have to think more about the priors and add some information. Yeah, which is, if you ask me, a blessing in disguise, right? Because uh, just because a model seems to run doesn't mean it is giving you sensible results and unbiased results. Right? So yeah. I actually love the fact that um, the like usually HMC is really unforgiving of yeah. really bad priors. Um, so of course, like uh, it's usually something we we tend to teach is eh, try to use priors that make sense, right? A priori. Uh, most of the time, you have more mm -hmm. information than you think. And if you're thinking from a betting perspective, right? Let's say that any decision you make with your model is actually something that's going to cost you money or give you money. If you were to bet mm -hmm. on that prior, why wouldn't you use any information that you have at your disposal? Why would you throw yeah. away information if you knew that actually you had information that would help you make a more informed bet and so a bet that gives you actually more money instead of losing money? Um, and so I find that this way of framing the priors can actually, like usually works um, on beginners because that helps them see the like the idea. It's like the idea is, the idea is not to fudge your analysis even though I can show you how to fetch your analysis, but in both ways. Yeah. Right? I can use priors yeah, yeah. which are going to bias the model, but I can also use priors that are going to completely uh, unbiased the model, but just make it so variable that it's just going to answer very aggressively to any data point. And do you really want yeah. that? I'm, I'm not sure. Like, do you really want to make very um, uh, hard claims based on very small data? I'm not sure, right? So again, if you come back to this idea of, imagine that you're betting, wouldn't you use all the information you have at your disposal? That's all, that's yeah. everything you're doing, right? That doesn't mean that information yeah. is golden. That doesn't mean you have to be extremely certain about your, the information you're putting in. That just means let's try to put some more structure because that's that doesn't make any sense if you're, I don't know, modeling um, football players that doesn't mean make any sense to allow them to uh, be able to score 20 goals in a game. Right? It doesn't ever mm -hmm. happen. So yeah. why would you let the model allow for that possibility? You don't want that. It's going to make your yeah. model harder to estimate longer. It's going to take longer to estimate also. And so that's just, that's just less efficient. Yeah, that's, yeah. Um, you mentioned too of HMC being unforgiving, uh, and yeah, a lot of the the software that I've been working on, the model is run in Stan, and um, from time to time, well, for some of these structural equation models, there's some like weakly identified parameters or maybe even unidentified mm -hmm. parameters. But yeah. I run into these situations where somebody runs a Gibbs sampler and they say, look, it just worked and it converged. And now I move this model over to Stan and I'm getting these bimodal posteriors or such and such. Yeah. Uh, it's it's sort of like a bit of an education uh, of saying, well, the problem isn't Stan. No, like the problem was the model all along. But yeah, the yeah. Gibbs sampler just didn't tell you that there was a problem. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's like, um, that's a joke. I have actually a, a sticker like that, which is a, which is a meme of, you know, that meme of that, that, that guy from, uh, I think it's from the notebook, right? Who, who is crying. And, uh, yeah, basically the sticker yeah, I have yeah. is, uh, when someone tells me that, uh, their model, he has divergences in HMC. So they are switching to the Metropolis sampler. And, uh, <laughs> it's just, it's just yeah. that like, yeah, sure. Uh, that you're not going to have divergences with the Metropolis sampler. Um, doesn't yeah. mean the model is converging as you want. Um, yep. and <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's really yeah, that, that thing where, yeah, actually you had problems with the model already. It's just that you were using a crude instrument that wasn't able to give you these diagnostics. It's like, yeah. um, during, doing an MRI with a stethoscope. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's not going to work. Uh, it's going to look like you don't have any problems, but maybe you do. It's just like you're not using the right tool. Um, so, yeah. And yeah. and also this idea of, um, well, let's use flat priors and just let the data speak. That can work from time to time. And that's definitely going to be the case anyways if you have a lot of data, mm -hmm. even if you're using 
uh, weekly regularizing priors. That's exactly the goal. It's just to give enough structure to the model in case the data are not informative for some parameters. Yeah. And the bigger the model, the more parameters, well, the less informed the parameters are going to be if your data stay what they are, keep being what mm -hmm. they are, right? If you don't have more. Um, and also um, that, that assumes that the data are perfect, that there's no bias, yeah. that the data are, com are completely trustworthy. Do yeah, you actually yeah. believe that? If you don't, well, then you already know something about your data, right? That's your prior right here. Yeah. If you think that there is something biased and you kind of know why, well, that's a prior information. Right? So why wouldn't you tell that in the model? Again, from that betting perspective, you're just making your model's life harder and your inference is potentially wrong. So I'm guessing yeah. that's not what you want as the modeler. Mm, you know, yeah, yeah, so that's right. It's like, yeah, you can trust the data uh, blindly. Should you, though? That's a question you have to answer each time you're doing a model. Yep. Most often than not, you cannot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, uh, the, the, the HMC failing thing, I think that's a place where you can really see the progress that's been made in, in Bayesian estimation, just like mm -hmm. say in the 20 some years that I've been doing it, it you know, I can think back to starting out with wind bugs. You were just happy to get the thing to run and to, you know, give you some decent convergence diagnostics. Um, I think a lot of the things we did um, around the start of wind bugs, if, if you try to run them and stand now, you, find there were a lot of problems that were just hidden or you, you kind of overlooked. Yeah. 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 For sure. Um, and definitely that, I think we've hammered that point in the community quite a lot in the last <laughs> few years. And so definitely those points that I've been making, um, in, in the last few minutes are clearly starting to percolate. And, um, I, I think the situation is way yeah, yeah. better than it was a few years ago, just to be clear yep. and not uh, come across as a <laughs> complaining statistician <laughs> because, because I'm already French. So people already <laughs> imagine that I'm going to assume that I'm going to complain. So if on top of that, uh, I complain okay. about stats, well, I'm done. People are not going to listen to the podcast anymore. Yeah, so. <laughs> I think you'll be all right. <laughs> um, so to, um, to continue, uh, I'd like to talk about your Blavin package. Um, and mm -hmm. Many what inspired the development of the of this package, and how does it enhance the capa the capabilities of researchers uh, in doing BSEM? Yeah, uh, um, I think I said earlier my PhD was about um, some uh, Bayesian factor analysis models and looking at some missing data issues. I would say it, it like. It wasn't the greatest PhD thesis, but it was finished. And at the time I thought um, it would be nice to have some software that would give you some uh, somewhat simple way to specify a model. And then it could be translated to like at the time wind bugs uh, so that you could have some easier MCMC estimation. Um, but at that time, like I, the like R wasn't as quite as developed and my skills weren't quite there to be able to do that all on my own. Uh, so I left it for a few years and then around 2009 or so, I think um, some R packages for frequentist structural equation models were becoming uh, better developed and more supported. Uh, so uh, a few years later, I met uh, the developer of the Lavan package, which which does frequent structural equation models, and did some work with him. And from there, I, I thought, well, he's done some of the hard work already, just with model specification and setting up the model likelihood. So I, I built this package on top of what was already there to do like the Bayesian version of, of that model estimation. And, and then it, it has just gone from there. I think I, I continue to learn more things about these models or encounter tricky issues that I wasn't quite aware of when I started. And uh, I, I just uh, have continued on. 
yeah. Um, well, that sounds like a fun project for sure. And um, how how would people use it right now? Like, how would you? When would you recommend using your package for which type of problems? Well, the idea from the start was always um, make the model specification and everything very similar to the Lavan package for frequentist models, because that package was already fairly popular among people that use these models. And the idea was, well, they could move to doing a Bayesian version without having to learn a, a brand new model specification. They could already do something similar to what they had been doing on the frequentist side. So um, that's like from the start where we, the, the idea that we had or what we wanted to do with a package and then um, who would use it, I think, it could be for some of these measurement problems, like I said, with item response modelers or things, uh, if they wanted to do a Bayesian version of some of these models, that's uh, currently possible in Blavan. Another place is um, with something kind of similar to the the DAGs, the directed acyclic graphs we talk about, especially in the social sciences, people have these theories about they have a collection of variables and, and what variables cause what other variables and they mm -hmm. want to estimate some regression type relationships between these things yeah you would see it often like in observational data where you can't really do these these uh, manipulations the way you could in an experiment but the idea is that you could specify a graph like that and use blavon to try to estimate these these regression like relationships that if the graph is correct you might interpret it as causal relationships hmm. yeah fascinating fascinating i i love that and i i'll i'll put the uh, the package of course in the show notes and i encourage people to take a look at the at the website there there are some some tutorials and packages of the sorry some tutorials on how to use the package on there uh so yeah definitely take a look at the resources that uh there are on the website and of course everything is on the show notes um yeah. another topic i thought was very interesting from your um background is that your research also touches on forecasting and subjective probability um can you discuss yeah. how bayesian methods improve these processes particularly in crowdsourcing wisdom which is something uh you've worked on quite a lot yeah, yeah. I started working on that. It was probably 2009 or 2010. So at that time, I think uh, tools like Mechanical Turk were becoming more usable. And so people were looking at this wisdom of crowds thing, saying, can we recruit a large group of people from the internet? And if we average their predictions to do those make for good predictions mm -hmm. um I, I got involved in some of that work especially through some forecasting tournaments that were mm -hmm. being run by um the the u.s government or some branches of the u.s government at the time uh the I think Bayesian tools there first made some model estimations easier, just the way that they sometimes do in general. But also with forecasting, it's all about uncertainty. Um, you might say, here's what I think will happen, but then you also want to have some characterization of your certainty or uncertainty that, that something happens. I think that's where um, the Bayesian approach was really helpful. Of course, you you always have this trade-off with you, you are giving a forecast often to like a decision maker or an executive or someone that is a, a leader. Those people sometimes want the simplest forecast possible and it's mm -hmm. sometimes difficult to convince them that, well, you also want to look at the uncertainty around this forecast as opposed mm -hmm. to just a point estimate. Yeah, um, yeah. But but that's some of the ways we were using Bayesian methods, at least to try to characterize uncertainty. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm becoming um, more and more <laughs> authoritative on these fronts, you know, uh, just not even <laughs> giving the point estimates anymore and by default yeah. giving a range uh, for the predictions. 
and then people have to ask you for the point estimates. Uh, and then I can make the point of, do you really want that? Why do you want that one? Um, and why do you want the mean more than uh, mm -hmm. the tail, right? Maybe in your case, actually, the tail scenarios are more interesting. Um, so keep that in mind. And so, yeah, like, do, do people have to opt in to get the point estimates? And, well, yeah. uh, the human brain being what it is, usually it's happy with the default. And so making the default better is something I'm trying to actually act actively do. <laughs> That's, yeah, that's a good point. So, so what for reporting modeling results, you avoid posterior means. All you give them is like a posterior interval or, or something. A range. Yeah. 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 Yeah, exactly. Uh, not putting particular emphasis on, on the mean because otherwise mm -hmm. what's going to end up happening. And that's extremely frustrating to me is, uh, imagine that you're comparing two option, um, and so you're, you have the posterior option A, the posterior option B. You're looking at the first plot of A and B. They seem to overlap. So then mm -hmm. you compute the difference of the posteriors. So B minus A, and you're, you're seeing where it spans on the real line, right? Um, mm -hmm. And if option A and B are close enough, the, the HDI, so the highest density interval, is going to overlap with zero. Mm -hmm. And it seems like zero is a magic number that makes the whole HDI collapse on one point. So basically the zero is a black hole, which just sucks everything <laughs> onto itself. And then the whole uh, range is zero. Um, <laughs> and then people are just going to say, oh, but that's weird because, um, no, I think there is some difference between A and B. And then you have to say, but that's not what the model is saying. Now you're just looking yeah. at zero and you see that the HDI overlaps zero at some point, but actually the model is saying that, I don't know, there is an 86% chance that um, option B is actually better than, option B is actually better than A. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there is a five in six chance, which is absolutely non, non negligible that B is indeed better than A, but we cannot yeah. rule out the possibility that A is better than B. That's what the model is saying. It's not telling you that mm -hmm. there is no difference, and it's not telling you that A is definitely better than B. Uh, and that yeah. is still an item I'm trying, I'm trying to crack, but yeah, uh, here you cannot make the, um, like you cannot make the zero disappear. Right. But you, the only thing yeah. you can do is make sure that people don't interpret the zero as a black hole. That's the main thing. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. Uh, I, um, I can see that being challenging for people that come from frequentist models because what they're accustomed to the maximum likelihood estimate and mm -hmm. you know yeah. it's all about those point estimates yeah, uh, yeah. but I, I like the idea of not even supplying those point estimates yeah 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 i mean um and that makes sense in the way that it's just a distraction it doesn't mean anything in particular that's mainly mm -hmm. a distraction what's more important here is the range of yeah. of the the estimates so you know like give the range and give the point estimates if people ask ask for it but otherwise, yeah. that's more distraction than anything else. And I think I got that idea from listening to a talk by Richard McGareth, uh, who was talking yeah. about something he called table two fallacy. Um, yeah, so that's yeah. from academic papers, um, where usually they present the, the table of estimates in the table mm -hmm. two. Uh, and usually people tend to, his point was that people tend to interpret the coefficient on a linear regression, for instance, as all of them as causal, but yeah, they are not. Yeah. Right? The only parameter that's really causally interpretable is the one that relates the treatment to the outcome. The other one, yeah. uh, for instance, from a mediator to the outcome or um, uh, the one from a confounder to the outcome, you cannot interpret that parameter as causal. Yeah. Or you have to do the causal graph analysis and then see if the linear regression you, you ran actually corresponds to the one you would have to run in this new causal DAG to identify yeah. or the direct or the total causal effect of that new variable that you're taking at the treat as the treatment, basically. You're changing the treatment here. So yeah. you have to change the model, potentially. And so you cannot interpret and should absolutely not interpret the parameters that are not the one from the treatment to the outcome as 
causally interpretable. Yeah, and yeah. so to avoid that fallacy, he was suggesting two options, or you actually provide the interpretation of that parameter in the current DAG that you have and mm -hmm. say, if it's not causally interpretable in that case, which DAG you would have, which uh, regression, sorry, which model you would have to use, which is different from the one you actually have ran yeah. to actually be able to interpret that uh, coefficient causally, or you just don't report these parameters. These coefficients, yeah, yeah, because they are not, they are like they are not the point of the analysis. The point of the analysis is to relate the treatment to the outcome and see what the effect of the treatment is on the outcome, not what the treatment of a confounder on the outcome is. So, why would you report that in the first place? You can report it if people ask for, it, but you don't. Yeah, you should not report it by default. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's some good like tie-ins to structural equation models there too, because I think like in some of those some of McElrath's examples. Uh, he dabbles a little bit in structural equation model and to as kind of like a one possible solution here to um, to to really you know saying what could we interpret causally or not in the presence of like confounding variables or like there's the colliders that all, also cause problems if yeah. you include them in a regression. Um, yeah, he does a little bit. I've seen some of his examples like with structural equation model sorts of things. I think there's something interesting there about um, informing what predictors like should go in a regression or what could we interpret causally out of uh, out of a particular model yeah 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 exactly and uh i've actually i have actually linked to the um to the the table two fallacy uh thing i was talking about uh his his video of that so uh, these will be in the show notes for people cool. who want to dig deeper. Yes. Um, and, um, yeah, super interesting discussion. I really love to, to talk about these, these topics as, as you can see, and I've really deeply enjoyed, um, uh, diving deeper into them. Uh, and still yeah. I'm, I'm diving deeper into these, these topics for 2024. That's one of my <laughs> objectives. So that's, that's really fun. Uh, yeah, maybe. Let's talk about latent viable models, uh, because you also mm -hmm. work on that. And if I understood correctly, they are quite crucial in psychology. Um, so how, like, how do you approach these models, especially in the context of patient stance? And maybe explain also, give us a primer on what latent viable models are. Yeah, I would. So sometimes I almost use them as like just another term for structural equation model. They're, they're very related i would say i would say if i'm around like psychology or psychometrics people i would use the term structural equation model mm -hmm. but if i'm around statistics people i might more often use the term latent variable model because um i think that that term latent variable what it, it or maybe sometimes people might say a hidden variable or something it's it's something that's unobserved um but it, it's like in in structural equation modeling, that is sort of just like a random effect or a random parameter mm -hmm. that we assume has some influence on other observed variables. Um, and and, and that think, you never, and that you can, uh, you can never observe it. That's right. That's and so, so the traditional example is. Um, maybe something related to intelligence or say like a person's math aptitude, something you would use a standardized test for. You can't directly observe it. You can ask many questions that get at a person's math aptitude. And we could assume, yes, there's this latent aptitude that each person has that we are trying to measure with all of our questions on a standardized test. Mm -hmm. uh, that sort of gets at the idea of latent variable. Yeah. Yeah. And like, or another example would be, um, the latent popularity of political parties. Like you never really observe them. Actually, you just have an idea with polls, you have yeah. a better idea with elections, but even elections are not a perfect image of that because, uh, nobody, like not everybody goes and votes. Uh, so yeah, that's right. That's like you can actually never observe the actual popularity 
of political parties in the total population because, well, uh, even elections don't make a perfect job of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then people will get into a lot of like deep philosophy conversations about like, does this latent variable even exist? And like, how could one characterize that? And personally, I don't often get into those deep philosophy conversations. I just more think of this as a model and within this model, it could be a random parameter. And, mm -hmm. and I guess maybe it's just my personal bias. I don't think about it too abstractly. I just think about how does this latent variable function in a model and how could I fit this model to data? Yeah, I see. Um, and so in these, in these cases, how like do you found that using a Bayesian framework has been helpful? Yeah, I, I think, um, it, it's, I think related to what I was, uh, discussing before about these latent variables are often like random effects. And so, um, from a Bayesian point of view, you can sample those, those parameters and look at how their uncertainty filters through to other parts of your model. That's all very straightforward from a Bayesian point of view. I, I think mm. those are some of the big advantages. Mm. Okay. I see. I see. Um, if we de-zoom a bit, I'm actually curious, what would you say is the biggest hurdle in the Bayesian workflow currently? Um, there's always challenges with how long does it take MCMC to run, uh, especially for people coming from frequentist models or things where, you know, for, for some frequentist models, especially with, with these structural equation or latent variable models, you can get some maximum likelihood estimates in a couple of seconds. And there's cases with, with MCMC, it, it might take much longer depending on how the model is set up or how tailored your estimation strategy is to a particular model. So I think speed is, is always an issue. Um, and that I think could maybe detract some people from doing Bayesian modeling sometimes. I would say maybe the other barrier to the workflow is just getting people to slow down and, and just be happy with slowing down with, with working through their model. Uh, it, I think especially in the social sciences where I work, um, people have become too accustomed to, to like specifying their model, pressing a button, getting the results immediately and writing it and being done. And I think that's, that's not how good Bayesian modeling happens. The good Bayesian modeling, you, you sit back a little bit and, and think through everything. And mm -hmm. I, that, that I think is a challenge convincing people sometimes to make that uh, habitual part of the workflow. Yeah. Bayesian models need love. <laughs> you, you need to That's give right. it love for sure. Um, I personally have been working lately on uh, an academic project like that, where we're writing a paper on basically it's a, a trade paper on biology, uh, marine biology trade. And, um, mm -hmm. The model is extremely complex, um, and that's why I'm, I'm on this project is to uh, work with the um, the academics working on that who are extremely knowledgeable, of course, about on on their domain. Mm -hmm. And me, mm -hmm. I don't understand anything about the biology part, but <laughs> I'm just here to try and make the model work. Um, and the model is like tremendously complicated because the phenomenon they are studying is extremely complex. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but like here, the the amazing thing is that the person leading the project, Aaron McNeil, has an, a huge appetite for that kind of work, right? And really love mm -hmm. doing the Bayesian model, um, coding it, and and then improving it together. But definitely, that's a big endeavor. It takes a lot of time. Yeah. But then the model is extremely powerful afterwards, and you can get a lot of inferences that you cannot have with a classic yeah. um, trivial model. So, you know, 
Uh, <laughs> there is yeah. no free lunch, right? If your model is trivial, mm -hmm. your inferences probably will be, unless you're extremely um, lucky and you're just working on something that nobody has worked on before. So then it's yeah, like, yeah. Uh, like just a forest completely new. But otherwise, um, if you want extreme, if you want interesting inferences, you have to have an interesting model, and that takes time, takes dedication. Yeah. But for sure, it's extremely interesting, and then after once, it gives you a lot of power. Um, so, uh, you know, it's it's a bit yeah. of that's also a bit frustrating to me in the sense that the model is actually not going to be really part of the paper, right? Uh, people just care about the results of the model, oh, yeah. uh, but me, it's like. And I mean, it's... it makes sense, right? It's like when you buy a car, yeah, the engine is important, but you care about the whole car, right? But I'm guessing yeah, that yeah. the person who built the engine is like, yeah, but without the engine, it's not even a car. <laughs> so why why don't you give credit to the engine? Uh, but yeah. that, that makes sense. But it's it was really fun for me to see because like for me, the model is really the thing. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's actually almost like not even be going to be a part of the of the paper is going to be an annex or something like that, right? Uh, yeah. The, the, the yeah, I was going to say, the they, they, it's really weird for they me. Say, like, for... put it in the appendix. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, so I'm, I've already taken a lot of your time, Ed, so um, let's, uh, let's head up for, for the last two questions. Before that, though, I'm curious, okay. um, Looking forward, what exciting developments do you foresee in Bayesian psychometrics? Uh, the one that I, I, I see coming is, is related to the speed issue again. So um, I, what, there's, there's more and more MCMC stuff with uh, GPUs. And I was at a, a stand meeting last year where they were talking about um, you know, imagine being able to run hundreds of parallel chains that all like share a burn in so that, you know, one chain isn't going to go off and do something really crazy. I, I think all of that is really interesting. And I think that could really improve some of these bigger psychometric models that, uh, that you know, can take a while to run if, if we could do uh, lots of parallel chains and be pretty sure that they're going to converge. That would, I think is something coming that will be very useful. Yeah, um, that definitely sounds like a, an awesome project. Um, so before letting you go, Ed, I'm going to ask you the last two questions I ask every guest at the end of the show. First okay. one, if you had unlimited time and resources, which problem would you try to solve? Yes. Uh, So I guess people should say, you know, world hunger or world peace or, or something. But um, I, I think I would probably go for something that's closer to what I do. And uh, one thing that comes to mind involves um, maybe improving math education or making it more accessible to more people. Um, I think at least in the, the U S like for younger kids growing up with math, it feels a little bit like sports where if you are fortunate to have gotten into it really early, then you like have this advantage and, um, and you do well, but if you come into math late, say maybe as a teenager, I think what happens sometimes is you see other people that are way ahead of you, like solving problems you have no idea how to do. And then you get uh, maybe not so enthusiastic and you just leave and, and do something else with your life. I, I think more could be done just to try to get more interested people like staying in, in math related fields and uh, doing more work there. I think with unlimited resources, that's the sort of thing that I would try to do. Hmm. Yeah, um, I love that, and definitely I can. Yeah, I can. I can understand why why you would why you would say that. That's that's a very good point. Um, um, I was gonna say I was late coming to around to math myself. Um, I think I don't know what happens in every country, but 
in the U.S., it feels like you're just expected to think that math is this tough thing that's not for you. And um, unless you have like uh, influences in your life that would convince you otherwise, I think a lot of kids just just don't even make an attempt to do something with math. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good point. Um, and second question, if you could have dinner with any great scientific mind, dead, alive, or fictional, who would it be? Yeah, this is the one that uh, is easy to overthink or to really <laughs> yeah. uh, make a big thing about. But so here's... Here's one thing that I think about. Uh, there's, I think it's called Stigler's Law, about it's related to this idea that the person who is known for like a major finding or scientific result often isn't the one that did the hard work. Uh, maybe they were the ones that, that were like promoted themselves the most or, um, or otherwise just got their name attached. And so, if I'm having dinner, I want it to be more of a low key dinner. So mm -hmm. I don't necessarily want to go for the most famous person that is the most known for something because I worry that they would just like promote themselves the whole time or <laughs> you would feel like you're talking to a robot because they're, they're like, they see themselves as kind of above everyone. So with that in mind, um, and, and keeping on the Bayesian viewpoint, uh, one person that comes to mind is uh, Ariana Rosenbluth, who mm -hmm. was one of the, I think, was the first to like program a Metropolis Hastings algorithm mm -hmm. and, and did yeah. it in the context of the Manhattan Project during World War II. Yeah. So I think she would be an interesting person to have dinner with. She clearly uh, did some important work. Uh, didn't quite get the recognition that, that some others did. But also, I think she didn't have a traditional academic career. So that means at dinner, you know, you could talk about some work things, but also I think she she would be interesting to talk to just, uh, you know, just about other non-work things. That's the kind of dinner that I would like to have. Yeah. So that's my answer. Love it. Love it, Ed. Uh, fantastic answer. Uh, and uh, definitely invite me to the dinner that would be fascinating um yes. <laughs> fantastic thanks a lot ed um we can call it a show uh that okay. was this was great i learned a lot and uh as usual i will put uh, a link to your website and your socials and tutorials in the show notes for those who want to dig deeper thank you again all right ed, for taking the time and being on the show yeah, thanks for having me it was fun This has been another episode of Learning Bayesian Statistics. Be sure to rate, review, and follow the show on your favorite podcatcher and visit learnbaystats.com for more resources about today's topics as well as access to more episodes to help you reach true Bayesian state of mind. That's learnbaystats.com. Our theme music is Good Bayesian by Beba Brinkman, fit MC Lars and Megaran. Check out his awesome work at bebabrinkman.com. I'm your host, Alex Andorra. You can follow me on Twitter at Alex underscore Andorra, like the country. You can support the show and unlock exclusive benefits by visiting patreon.com slash learnbaystats. Thank you so much for listening and for your support. You're truly a good Bayesy and change your predictions after taking information in. And if you're thinking I'll be less than amazing, let's adjust those expectations. Let me show you how to be a good Bayesy and change calculations after taking fresh data in. Those predictions that your brain is making, let's get them on a solid foundation.